I thought that I would take this opportunity uh, in a sort of dual role to talk about some things that uh, my partner and I, Jeff Heller, and I've seen for a long time in the course of our practice and um, my evolving role as uh, president in 2011 of the AIA because it's uh, really part of this important dynamic. And I, I think there's been a lot of things and I can really understand Tony's pain in St. Petersburg, San Francisco, as many of you know, is a, is a very difficult place to get approval and um, with, with Art and Tony talking about buildings of, uh, you know, a thousand or two thousand feet, that's, that's a fantasy in San Francisco. So, so let me talk about a couple things that, that I wanted to sort of share my observations on and, and the images down below are sort of representative of, of what uh, many of us see in the United States. and. Um, uh, the discussions earlier this morning about the sort of uh, frozen uh, financing markets and the inability to move projects forward is demonstrated in some of these projects. And uh, I guess I would say that uh, being involved in, in high-rise design projects, there is always the challenge of whether the project will actually go ahead and whether it will be in this cycle or not. Um, with that said, uh, I thought this was a good starting point after lunch, uh, and many of you may have seen this movie with Shrek, but really, it, it makes a great observation of, do you really think that he's compensating for something? And so this obviously in a low scale environment um, is really about towers. Um, what I really want to talk about is in the letters that are in CTBUH is the UH in the urban habitat. And I think that's one of the, the trends that, that I see and hear going on uh, around the country and probably around the world. And the work that we've uh, gotten recently in China is really about that. So construction and urban planning. Um, blue represents those that, that I see as commonalities. Red are the differences. So sustainability we can talk about, but the dialogue, uh, particularly as it relates to uh, most of the organizations and LEED, is really about individual buildings. There are pilot programs associated with, with uh, master plan developments, but there's not a lot of them, and we're really looking at buildings. And, and I'd be the first one to say that building a building in a particular place where it's not sustainable really doesn't make sense for creating a livable community. Um, so sustainability, Hearst, many of you know that New York, one of the early lead projects as a part of that uh, comment made in my office recently was that the project wouldn't comply. Uh, others in New York that many of you are aware of are again aspiring to that sort of lead goal level which everybody thinks is sort of the benchmark and a project that we did with Tishman Spire and KPF in New York is the first lead gold office tower in San Francisco and I believe actually in San Francisco. So the, the challenges that all of us see in the course of design is very difficult and they are really based on individual buildings. Skin fenestration, we were here last night and we really talk about glass. Uh, this is an image that I found of a project in Melbourne that really begins to deal with the skin and what the skin is able to do. Um, the articulation of glass skins in many ways and many of those who are uh, green consultants are telling me that you know the era of green buildings uh, and uh, glass skins is really uh, is going to close upon us. I'm not really quite sure of that as manufacturers get better. A uh, project here that many of you know is really an exploration of concrete and residential, but very different than uh, the kind of projects that we see in San Francisco. And a project in New York that I thought was interesting in terms of it being a scrim uh, rather than a sort of glass. And so uh, the fenestration, whether it's solid or glass, is really something that we all play with in buildings. And you've seen two presents, presentations to talk about that. Um, but I had a conversation yesterday about integrated project delivery, and this is one of those common alleys that's really happening. And uh, Michael Sorkin, who many of you follow, is really sort of talking about how our industry is uh, either connected or disconnected. And many of us who have practiced for a long time have seen the way the profession and sort of both the construction and architectural engineering have been separate, and we're sort of trying to come together. But, but Integrated project delivery is really a tool and, and really it's one that I think that in the course of the next five or ten years, particularly those of us who have begun to really embrace the use of BIM uh, are really a part of that and I think it's really incumbent upon us so it's one of those sort of commonalities that I think is really essential. And so the AIA's efforts in the last five years is really about several common things, collaboration, information sharing, success, 
shared risk and reward, that's actually a big thing, conversation that I had uh, recently is, are we actually sharing the risk and reward? Many of us as design professionals don't feel that we actually get the reward for that. And value-based decisions, not value engineered decisions where budgets are basically slashed because there's no way to be able to do that. And, 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 and an increasing technological world of utilizing the technology, we've seen that in presentations so far this morning. And I think that that's really a part of what the guiding post for the profession uh, uh, and the AEC profession is really going to be. Um, personal experience and one that we did with uh, Tishman Spire and Architectonic on the top and one on the right uh, is a one ring con that Solomon Cordwell Benz did is both a 10 year process that we undertook on the building on the left to develop a performance based structural design. Many of you know and uh, as structural engineers what the challenges are in seismic zones but in the course of discussion and I use this as an example uh, that the planners uh, who don't really understand the nature of doing buildings uh, believe, and Vancouver is probably the best example on the west coast, is skinny buildings, small small cores. You can see how small the core is compared to the one on the right for the infinity that we were involved in and exiting through through stair lobbies. And I, and I think that that's really a key thing. And when we talk about pencil buildings, they are a... Uh, a fantasy in many instances of planning departments, but when you look at the floor plates, as we've seen in some of the presentations this morning, they are big buildings and big floor plates, and, and clearly the challenge in a new world of economics is one that we're going to be forced upon us. Um, I, I often find, because our practice is really a lot about San Francisco uh, and and New, newly in China, that here's three cities, and some of you know the, the idiosyncrasies of this. One is the one in New York, one is the one in Chicago here, and one is the one in San Francisco, and I use this as an example. Um, so if you look at Heinz's Nouvelle Tower, I mean, there was a decision recently, which is as hard to even comprehend, that they would actually take 200 feet off of a building that was actually built and um, were actually uh, under construction uh, because of the fear that the building would actually take away from the Chrysler building's iconic nature. And we talk about iconic towers. The Chicago Spire, it's 200 feet taller uh, than, than the Sears Tower. And um, the, the nature of that actually, if you looked at the, at the present this morning. Um, it's remarkable in terms of its scale on the skyline. And I asked earlier, I know, about Philadelphia having been there, is what the nature of skyline developments are. And, and the, this group here, which is a really uh, pretty robust group of people who have great experience, uh, we look at buildings sort of in isolation because that's really what we're hired to do. But the importance of the skyline character is really key. And the third, really, which is sort of um, a, even an amazing evolution in the last 20 years, and I think was derived from the, uh, ultimately the demolition of the Embarcadero Freeway is uh, the competition winning by Heinz and, uh, and Pelly on a transit tower. And the arguments that have been going on in the course of the rezoning for probably the course of two years is whether the building is 1,000 is thousand feet or 1,200 feet. So you look at this in the scheme of things and you begin to understand that across the U.S. there are really different measures about the way people feel that height belongs in their community. And as Tony said in St. Petersburg, a historic city, there is a fundamental visceral reaction to height and somehow it needs to be addressed. And I think that's part of a bigger dialogue. Um, this, I, this I found, which I, I found actually very interesting. Right in the middle, it's hard to see, is the Washington Monument. And on either side of these are some of the buildings that we've had presented here. On the far left is Frank Lloyd Wright's uh, originally conceived tower. And, and the variety of include everything from the tower in Guangzhou to Petronas and the Freedom Tower. And you look at the scale of this and you look at the scale of a city like Washington, D.C., which will never break the height limit. And we begin to look at why height really is far easier actually outside of the United States and why it's really far more difficult to be able to, to push height limits in places. And in New York, which you'd expect to have never any problem with it, has made a decision that actually reversed that. So let me now talk a little bit about uh, what I see in the green building policy and changing the environment. And that, that's really happened as a result of the economy. Uh, you know, two years ago, uh, we couldn't do more for uh, doing sustainably, but I think a lot of the, the challenges are really before us. And uh, the AIA, which uh, I've been involved in for five years and continue to want to be involved in because it represents a big voice, has done three separate studies. And some of these questions are obviously um, sort of, they're, they're logical in their expression. And one of the questions that was asked in a recent study was, you know, in the course of this economy, have you changed your building policy in light of the economic? Downturn. So the resounding answer was no. 
And then you go on and you ask the next question, you know, is the development going on in your community? And the answer is sort of maybe progress. People are really not probably telling the story that really is the fact that there's really a lot of stuff that's stopped in this country and probably won't get started for another couple of years if all of us sort of hold our breath associated with it. So in the course of research, we're, we were really looking at what the local leaders and sustainability is about. But one of the things that, that I really have begun to see, uh, and, I, and I'm probably because uh, the, way, the way San Francisco is, that I believe that, and I see this, is that cities really are the manifestation of an impetus for building green policy. It is not come from the federal government, and it is really not come from the private sector uh, in any significant way related to tall buildings. Many of us see uh, lead platinum buildings out in the middle of a field. The buildings look terrific, but they really don't demonstrate, in my mind, the, the characteristics of what true sustainability is for livable communities. And so cities in their, in their toolkit have basically either gone to climate protection agreements, they've looked to tax incentive in some places, bonus densities, expedited permitting. And then the one interesting development probably in the last year with regard to California is, although Title 24 has been there, is actually two pieces of legislation, one uh, Senate Bill 30, 375 and Assembly Bill 32. And they, they are requiring that funding be associated with the development, the common development of transportation, housing, and land use in a way that has never been done before. And um, the next step in my mind is whether it will begin to spread across the country, whether we'll see it at a federal level or you know, as I, I, would, I would acknowledge, California is always in a very strange place, always trying to innovate and doing things in a way that perhaps is a challenge for those people who will build buildings or develop them. And then the most, the most recent development, and this is two or three months old, and, and some of you may know about it, may be involved about it, is the evolution of a green construction, IGCC code. Um, and what I would tell you is that what I have seen is the move from an elective process to one that ultimately, probably by 2012, will become mandatory and cities will want to adopt it. Many of us go to building departments and, and try and advocate for why we should do certain things and the build official who is not really as seasoned as perhaps the design professionals are involved are really talking about things that are about that. So I want to just sort of touch for a minute on what that involves and those of you who perhaps are interested might want to follow this a little bit more because I do think that it's really important. It does affect the buildings that, that we do in the U.S. and ultimately I think it will be part of what the global reaches and, and currently the way it's been put together, it's a joint partnership of AIA, ASTM and ICC. It will apply to traditional commercial and high-rise performance buildings and of course the code will address energy efficiency, water use, materials and resource conservation and indoor air quality and overall building impact on the environment which many of us feel is really important. The approach is written in mandatory language and will provide a new regulatory framework, less discretionary, more mandatory, designed with local, state, and federal in mind. And the development process will be the same used for the other I-code elements, and the final draft will be in current by 2012 of the code. So this is, a, in my mind, based on what I've seen, is a groundbreaking change in what we've seen is an elective process. So last that I want to touch on is who's the greenest and who's the most sustainable and every building obviously wants to aspire to that, uh, whatever lead level that they're aspiring to or whatever communities are doing. So I took a look at some things that, that I was aware of and I knew and I did a little bit more research and one of the things that clearly jumped out to me and I've lived half of my life on the West Coast and I lived half on the East Coast is the West Coast cities are clearly leading in the ability to create um, green cities, okay? Um, we can say that Chicago is led in many ways on green roofs and a variety of things, New York and others, uh, and other cities are really, and you can see in this chart here where, you know, in this particular chart, you use Seattle, San Francisco, Portland, Oakland, San Jose, Austin, Sacramento, Boston, Denver, Chicago, San Diego, and New York. Um, and each one of them is really a part of the, what you see in the criteria in terms of what they contribute to that. And uh, NRDC, obviously well, uh, well regarded organization, really interested in environmental protection. Many of us are really interested in the way our buildings are delivered to the environment. All other, su other studies that obviously are affect, affect our analysis is Brookings and Popular Science and Green Cities Report, and you probably know many more than that. And so in the course of you know, what the green crown means, the other resources that, that we're all aware of is EPA, Green Cities, How Green Is My Town, ICLEI, and Living Cities. And, and they are all part of what this is. 
So also in the course of you know, try, trying to get a better sense as a result of this conference and things that I believe are important in our practices, um, I found a couple things that were interesting, one from the New York Times, and I'll just sort of read this because I, I found it very compelling as to what the next steps are. So half a century ago, American engineering was the envy of the rest of the world. Cities like New York, Los Angeles, and New Orleans were considered models for a brilliant new future. Europe, with its suffocating traditions and historical baggage, was dismissed as a decadent aging culture it's no small paradox that many people in the world now see it as a similar terms. And President Obama, who we know is really trying to do some remarkable things, has a rare opportunity to build a new, more enlightened version of the country, one rooted in its own egalitarian ideas, and it's an opportunity that may not come around again. And I will tell you at the end of this, one of the things that I'm still troubled with is the U.S.'s ability to actually move forward. Uh, our firm's work in China in the last year has really demonstrated to me why intent is really must be delivered. So if I, if I go on and I, and, I, and I look at some other things that I think are really a manifestation of that, and these are sort of more editorial in any way, but I do, represent, do I think they represent what we are all been thinking about that, and we've talked about this density is green, putting solar panels on roofs doesn't change the essential fact that any sensible measure spread out low rise buildings with the more foundation walls and roofs have a larger carbon footprint than a high rise office building, and we all know that, and even when the high rise has no green features at all. And then I'll go on. Being truly green means returning to the kind of dense cities and garden suburban uh, Americans built in the first half of the 20th century. It's all order, but after the binge of the last housing boom, which many of us are, are seeing, many Americans are ready to consider a downsizing. So with that said, I think that it's incumbent upon an organization like CTBUH to be a part of the dynamic and the dialogue on policy, not to just talk about the technical stuff. So where does that lead us? Um, I know, based on my own particular experience and our firm's experience and what the AI has been doing, is we really need to be talking about livable and sustainable communities, not buildings in isolation. We all like tall buildings. We all think they're graceful. They all think they provide an opportunity in, in that. And the, the importance of whether the building is green or it's transit-oriented or livable or walkable is a real key thing. Uh, just this past week, the California Medical Association adopted a resolution that, in fact, was uh, championing need for medical practitioners to be involved in what is really called livable cities. And the AI has aspired to what those uh, 10 goals are. And the last one, which I think we all, we all think is a, an essential piece, is why design does matter. And I've talked about transportation and the creation of built and livable and vibrant public spaces and creating neighborhood identities. Buildings in isolation, and we all do them, and my firm does them, are really a part of the fabric of that. The AIA as, a, as an entity and the CTBU could be really very much a part of that dialogue and I've been trying to uh, basically pull them together are things that are associated with sustainable design assistance teams or even the importance of advocacy. And we can't basically be quiet because the people that we talk to in Washington and legislation don't really understand the full picture and we're most empowered to do that. And in those things, there are things like the Waxman-Markley bill or other transportation things, but in the latest, um, stimulus money, one of the big disappointments for many of us that the money really wasn't identified for anything more than uh, ro roadways and it didn't provide the opportunity for green buildings to sort of take their own opportunity. I'll just use an example from San Francisco, one that I know very well. I've spent the last 20 years in a variety of ways, either a, as a citizen architect or as a, a role in our firm, and they really are two areas in San Francisco that would, never would have happened as, as, if the, if the elevated freeway was not demolished. And I asked this question earlier this morning about the creation of a, a, a city skyline. And, and that, I think, and, and I asked this question, I know I, I challenged Garrett to that, is that I think that it's important that in looking at the scale of the city, we look what the character of the skyline is. Because although we all want to be involved in projects that break the height limit, I think the character of what the city skyline is, a memorable thing, is very important. And in San Francisco, this was a part of it. Uh, we are part of doing some of the buildings, and we are part of the dialogue with the, with the planning department. So two areas that I'll just sort of touch on briefly, one Rincon Hill, one Trans Bay. One of them is the creation of a multimodal, grand central-like transit district on the top near the Trans Bay Transit Center. And the top is really about the creation of 5,000 units uh, in an area bounded by two blocks, two by uh, six blocks uh, uh, close to the eastern waterfront. The latest change in the skyline, clearly not 
um, the kind of height that we've been talking about so far. The tallest building, which is one Rincon, uh, is uh, 550 feet, and the two towers next to it, which are the infinity, are 350 feet, 300, um, sorry, 350 and 400 feet. And very much like Tony's conversation about height, I remember doing 80 community presentations trying to convince people on the extreme western side of the city why it was important to create density and why it was an important thing for the long-term attribute of the city. Um, the, the, basically the incorporation of open space, the creation of parks, um, and, and uh, the conversations that, that I've had with people is that, you know, in creating residential, you really are creating uh, communities. Um, and they're less about the individual buildings, but they're more about the big scale. Um, planners tend to sort of get down to nitty gritty. They really want to talk about storefronts when we talk about high rises. And I looked at many of the presentations this morning. I didn't really get the feel for really what that ground plane is real like. And yet the skyline profile on many of them is very elegant and beautiful. But when you begin to deal with cities and municipalities and planning officials, there's really a challenge to be able to deal with that. Okay, so, you know, other things like uh, openness to sky plans, building separations, they're all, all part of the dynamic of what livable communities are. So I want to just sort of conclude with uh, my firm's work very briefly that we have been doing lately, uh, which is really very exciting and has really manifested itself in the last year, uh, one in, in being hired and one winning a competition, and they're in the city of Guangzhou. Uh, many of you may know, originally Canton, um, third largest city in China, a uh, population of 10 million. And the, the, the opportunity that we had on the North Axis was by being hired by the mayor and the planning director, they were interested in us providing a critique and an evaluation and the potential changes that they would need to make because the city has begun to see that they need to create this livable community. Um, the project that's underway is for the 2010 Asian Games, you know, is a, is a combination of mixed use and, and retail and office and residential. But in many ways, the things that we saw when we began to look at the project uh, in its totality was ill-coordinated. It really didn't have the kind of things that the city was really looking to do. And so what happened, uh, and we were, we were fortunate enough to be selected in an international competition uh, three weeks ago for the South Axis, eight square miles, a big area um, for us to ha have had the opportunity to do. And really the, the key aspect of that, and this is sort of goes back to my commentary about livable communities, is why we tried to organize organize this around water, around transportation, about alternative uses to the automobile, and really a part of the dynamic that we all think is important in, in building dense is really creating communities that ultimately will evolve and people want to live to. So I just want to leave you with this, which I found sort of interesting, is that uh, movies are always a great epitomization or, uh, or, or articulation of what we really see. And the image on the right from Minority Report, you know, uh, those vehicles riding on the side of a building were really key. But I think that the thought that I would really sort of leave you with is, you know, are these images of the future cities that we envision? And do we really have the responsibility to reclaim the, the livable and urban habitat? And what I really believe is that this organization does have the opportunity in that UH that it that embodies to be able to move to a place where its voice in the creation of dense urban cities is possible. Thank you.